Section 17 of Diaries, Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Rome. Thus, about the 7th of February, we set out on our return to Rome by the same way we came, not daring to adventure by sea, as some of our company were inclined to do, for fear of Turkish pirates hovering on that coast nor made we any stay save at Albano to view the celebrated place and sepulchre of the famous duelists who decided the ancient quarrel between their imperious neighbours with the loss of their lives. These brothers, the Horatii and Curatii, lie buried near the highway under two ancient pyramids of stone, now somewhat decayed and overgrown with rubbish. We took the opportunity of tasting the wine here, which is famous. Being arrived at Rome on the 13th of February, we were again invited to Signor Angeloni's study, where with greater leisure we surveyed the rarities, as his cabinet and medals especially esteemed one of the best collections of them in Europe. He also showed us two antique lamps, one of them dedicated to Pallas, the other Laribus Sacru as appeared by their inscriptions, some old Roman rings and keys, the Egyptian Isis cast in iron, sundry rare basso relievos, good pieces of paintings, principally of Christ of Correggio, with this painter's own face admirably done by himself. Diverse of both the Bassanos, a great number of pieces by Titian, particularly the Triumphs, an infinity of natural rarities, dried animals, Indian habits and weapons, shells, etc., diverse very antique statues of brass, some lamps of so fine an earth that they resembled cornelians, for transparency and colour, hinges of Corinthian brass and one great nail of the same metal found in the ruins of Nero's golden house, in the afternoon we ferried over to Transtavere to the palace of Gicci to review the works of Raphael, and returning by Sant'Angelo we saw the castle as far as was permitted, and on the other side considered those admirable pilasters supposed to be of the foundation of the Pons Sublicius, over which Horatius Cocles passed. Here anchor three or four water mills, invented by Lelitsarius, and thence had another sight of the Farnese's gardens, and of the terrace, where is that admirable painting of Raphael, being a cupid playing with a dolphin, wrought a fresco, preserved in shutters of wainscot, as well it merits, being certainly one of the most wonderful pieces of work in the world. 14th February 1645 I went to Santa Cecilia, a church built and endowed by Cardinal Rondetti, who had erected a stately altar near the body of this martyr, not long before found in a vesture of silk girt about, a veil on her head, and the bloody scars of three wounds on the neck. The body is now in a silver chest, with her statue over it, in snow-white marble. Other saints lie here, decorated with splendid ornaments, lamps, and incensories of great cost. A little farther they show us the bath of San Cecilia, to which joins a convent of friars, where is the picture of the flagellation by Vanni, and the columns of the portico taken from the bath of Septimius Severus. 15th February 1645 Mr. Henshaw and I walked by the Tiber and visited the Stola Tibetina, now St. Bartholomew's, formerly cut in the shape of a ship and wharfed with marble, in which a lofty obelisk represented the mast. In the church of St. Bartholomew is the body of the Apostle. Here are the ruins of the temple of Esculapius, now converted into a stately hospital and a pretty convent. Opposite to it is the convent and church of St. John Calabita, where I saw nothing remarkable save an old broken altar. Here was the temple of Fortuna Virilis. Hence we went to a cupola, now a church, formerly dedicated to the sun. Opposite to it, Santa Maria Scuola Greca, where formerly that tongue was taught, said to be the second church dedicated in Rome to the Blessed Virgin bearing also the title of a cardinalate. 
Behind this stands the great altar of Hercules, much demolished. Near this, being at the foot of Mount Aventine, are the Pope's salt houses. Ascending the hill, we came to San Sabina, an ancient fabric, formerly sacred to Diana. There, in a chapel, is an admirable picture, the work of Livia Fontana, set about with columns of alabaster, and in the middle of the church is a stone, cast, as they report, by the devil at San Dominique, while he was at Mass. Hence we travelled toward a heap of rubbish called the Marmorata, on the bank of the Tiber, a magazine of stone and near which formerly stood a triumphal arch in honour of Horatius vanquishing the Tuscans. The ruins of the bridge yet appear. We were now got to Mons Testarchaeus, a heap of pests herds almost 200 feet high, thought to have been thrown there in a mass by the subjects of the Commonwealth bringing their tribute in earthen vessels. Others, more probably, that it was a quarter of the town where potters lived. At the summit, Rome affords a noble prospect. Before it is a spacious green called the Hippodrome, where Olympic Games were celebrated, and the people mustered, as in our London artillery ground. Going hence to the old wall of the city, we much admired the pyramid or tomb of Caius Cestius of white marble, one of the most ancient entire monuments, inserted in the wall with this inscription, C. Scesius L. F. Pob Epulo, an order of priests, Pr. Tr. Pl. V. 1. 1. Ver. Epulonum, and a little beneath, Opus Absolutum Ex Textamenta Diebus C. 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 X. 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 Arbitratu Ponti P. F. Cla. Melae Heredis et Potil L. At the left hand is the port of St. Paul, once Tergamina, out of which the three Horatii passed to encounter the Curiati of Albano. Hence, bending homeward by St. Saba, by Antoninus's baths, which we entered, is the marble sepulchre of Vespasian. The thickness of the walls and the stately ruins show the enormous magnitude of these baths. Passing by a corner of the Circus Maximus, we viewed the place where stood the Septizonium, demolished by Sextus V, for fear of its falling. Going by Mons Culius, we beheld the devotions of San Maria in Avacula, so named from a ship carved out in white marble, standing on a pedestal before it, supposed to be the vow of one escaped from shipwreck. It has a glorious front to the street. Adjoining to this are the Horti Imatei, which only of all the places about the city I admitted visiting, though I was told inferior to no garden in Rome for statues, ancient monuments, aviaries, fountains, groves, and especially a noble obelisk, and maintained in beauty at an expense of 6,000 crowns yearly, which if not expended to keep up its beauty, forfeits the possession of a great revenue to another family. So curious are they in their villas and places of pleasure, even to excess. The next day we went to the once famous Circus Caracalla, in the midst of which there now lay prostrate one of the most stately and ancient obelisks, full of Egyptian hieroglyphics. It was broken into four pieces when overthrown by the barbarians, and would have been purchased and transported into England by the magnificent Thomas Earl of Arundel, could it have been well removed to the sea. This is since set together and placed on the stupendous artificial rock made by Innocent X, and serving for a fountain in Piazza Navona, the work of Berenini, the Pope's architect. Near this is a sepulchre of Metellus, of massy stone, pretty entire, now called Capo di Bovo. Hence to a small oratory named Domine Quo Vardis, where the tradition is that our blessed Saviour met St. Peter as he fled and turned him back again. St. Sebastian's was the next, a mean structure, the Faciata excepted, but is venerable, especially for the relics and grots in which lie the ashes of many holy men. Here is kept the pontifical chair, sprinkled with the blood of Pope Stephen, to which great devotion is paid. Also a well full of martyrs' bones, and the sepulchre of St. Sebastian, with one of the arrows used in shooting him. These are preserved by the Fulgentine monks. 
who have here their monastery, and who led us down into a grotto which their fern went diverse furlongs underground. The sides or walls which we passed were filled with bones and dead bodies, laid, as it were, on shelves, whereof some were shut up with broad stones, and now and then a cross or a palm cut in them. At the end of some of these subterranean passages were square rooms with altars in them, said to have been the receptacles of primitive Christians in the times of persecution, nor seems it improbable. 17th February 1645 I was invited after dinner to the Academy of the Humorists, kept in a spacious hall belonging to Signor Mancini, where the wits of the town meet on certain days to recite poems and debate on several subjects. The first that speaks is called the Lord and stands in an eminent place, and then the rest of the virtuosi recite in order. By these ingenious exercises, besides the learned discourses, is the purity of the Italian tongue daily improved. The room is hung round with devices or emblems with mottoes under them. There are several other academies of this nature bearing like fantastical titles. In this of the humorists is the picture of Guarini, the famous author of the Pastor Fido, once of this society. The chief part of the day we spent in hearing the academic exercises. 18th February 1645 we walked to St Nicholas in Carcere. It has a fair front and within are parts of the bodies of St Mark and Marcellino. On the tribuna is a painting of the Gentilici and the altar of Caval, Baglioni, with some other rare paintings. Coming round from hence we pass by the Circus Flaminius, formerly very large, now totally in ruins. In the afternoon we visited the English Jesuits with whose superior, P. Stafford, I was well acquainted, who received us courteously. They call their church and college San Tommaso degli Inglesi and is a seminary. Among other trifles they show the relics of Becket, their reputed martyr. Of paintings there is one of Durante and many representing the sufferings of several of their society executed in England, especially F. Campion. In the hospital of the Pellerini della San Trinita I had seen the feet of many pilgrims washed by princes, cardinals and noble Romans and served at table as the ladies and noble women did to other poor creatures in another room. It was told us that no less than 444,000 men had been thus treated in the Jubilee of 1600 and 25,500 women, as appears by the register, which brings store of money. Returning homeward, I saw the palace of Cardinal Spada, where is a most magnificent hall painted by Daniel di Volterra and Giulio Piancentino, who made the fret in the little court but the rare perspectives are of Bolognese. Near this is the Monpieta, instituted as a bank for the poor, who, if the sum be not great, may have money upon pawns. To this joins San Martino, to which belongs a scola or corporation that do many works of charity. Hence we came through Campo di Fiore, or Herb Market, in the midst of which is a fountain casting out water of a dolphin in copper, and in this piazza is common execution done. 19th February 1645 I went this afternoon to visit my Lord John Somerset, brother to the Marquis of Worcester, who had his apartment in Palazzo della Cancellaria, belonging to Cardinal Francesco Barberini as Vice-Chancellor of the Church of Rome and Protector of the English. The building is of the famous architect Bramante, of encrusted marble, with four ranks of noble lights. The principal entrance is of Fontana's design, and all marble. The portico within sustained by massy columns. On the second peristyle above, the chambers are rarely painted by Salviati and Vasari, and so ample is this palace that six princes with their families have been received in it at one time without incommoding each other. 20th of February 1645 
I went, as was my usual custom, and spent an afternoon in Piazza Navona, as well as to see what antiquities I could purchase among the people who hold market there for medals, pictures, and such curiosities, as to hear the mountebanks prate and distribute their medicines. This was formerly the circus, or agonales, dedicated to sports and pastimes, and is now the greatest market of the city, having three most noble fountains and the stately palaces of the Pamphili, San Giacomo de Spagnoli, belonging to that nation, to which had two convents for friars and nuns, all Spanish. In this church was erected a most stately catafalco, or cabalar ardente, for the death of the Queen of Spain. The church was hung with black, and here I heard a Spanish sermon, or funeral oration, and observed the statues, devices, and impresses hung about the walls, the church and pyramids stuck with thousands of lights and tapers, which made a glorious show. The statue of St. James is by Sansovino. There are also some good pictures of Caracci. The facciata, too, is fair. Returning home, I pass by the stumps of old Pasquin, at the corner of a street called Strada Pontificia, here they still paste up their drolling lampoons and scurrilous papers. This had formerly been one of the best statues for workmanship and art in all the city, as the remaining busts still show. 21st February 1645. I walked in the morning up the hill toward the Capuchins, where was then Cardinal Unufrio, brother to the late Pope Urban VIII, of the same order. He built them a pretty church, full of rare pictures, and there lies the body of St. Felix, that they say still does miracles. The piece at the great altar is by Lanfranc. It is a lofty edifice with a beautiful avenue of trees, and in a good air. After dinner, passing along the Strada del Corso, I observed the Colum Antoninus, passing under Arco Portugallo, which is but a relic, heretofore erected in honour of Domitian, called now Portugallo, from a cardinal living near it. A little further on the right hand stands the column in a small piazza, heretofore set up in honour of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, comprehending in a basso relievo of white marble his hostile acts against the Parthians, Armenians, Germans, etc., but is now somewhat decayed. On the summit has been placed the image of St. Paul of gilded copper. The pillar is said to be 160 feet high, ascended by 207 steps, receiving light by 56 apertures without defacing the sculpture. At a little distance are the relics of the Emperor's palace, the heads of whose pillars show them to have been Corinthian. Turning a little down, we came to another piazza in which stands a sumptuous vase of porphyry, and a fair fountain, but the grace of this market, and indeed the admiration of the whole world, is the Pantheon, now called San Maria della Rotonda, formerly sacred to all the gods, and still remaining the most entire antiquity of the city. It was built by Marcus Agrippa, as testifies the architrave of the portico, sustained by thirteen pillars of Theban marble, six feet thick and fifty-three in height, of one entire stone. In this porch is an old inscription. Entering the church, we admire the fabric, wholly covered with one cupola, seemingly suspended in the air and receiving light by a hole in the middle only. The structure is near as high as broad, viz. 144 feet, not counting the thickness of the walls, which is 22 more to the top, all of white marble until Urban VIII converted part of the metal into ordnance of war against the Duke of Parma, and part to make the high altar in St. Peter's, it was all over covered with Corinthian brass, ascending by forty degrees within the roof or convex of the cupola, richly carved in octagons in the stone. There are niches in the walls in which stood heretofore the statues of Jupiter and the other gods and goddesses, for here was that Venus which had hung in her ear the other union that Cleopatra was about to dissolve and drink up, as she had done its fellow. There are several of these niches, one above another, for the celestial, terrestrial and subterranean deities. But the place is now converted into a church dedicated to the Blessed Virgin and all the saints. 
The pavement is excellent and the vast folding gates of Corinthian brass. In a word, it is of all the Roman antiquities most worthy of notice. There lie interred in this temple the famous Raphael de Urbino, Perino del Vaga, F. Zuccararo and other painters. Returning home, we pass by Cardinal Cayetan's palace, a noble piece of architecture of Vincenzo Amananti, which is the grace of the whole Corso. 22nd February 1645. I went to Trinità del Monte, a monastery of French, a noble church built by Louis XI and Charles VIII. The chapel's well painted, especially that by Zacara de Volterra, and the cloister with the miracles of their St. Francis de Paolo and the heads of the French kings. In the pergolo above, the walls are wrought with excellent perspective, especially the St. John. There are the Babylonish dials invented by Kircha the Jesuit. This convent, so eminently situated on Mons Pincius, has the entire prospect of Campus Martius and has a fair garden which joins to the Palazzo di Medici. 23rd February 1645 I went to hear a sermon at San Giacomo degli Incurabili, a fair church built by F. de Volterra of good architecture, and so is a hospital where only desperate patients are brought. I passed the evening at San Maria del Popolo, heretofore Nero's sepulchre, where his ashes lay many years in a marble chest. To this church joins the monastery of St. Augustine, which has pretty gardens on Mons Pincius, and in the church is the miraculous shrine of the Madonna, which Pope Paul III brought barefooted to the place, supplicating for a victory over the Turks in 1464. In a chapel of the Gizi are some rare paintings of Raphael and noble sculptures. Those two in the choir are by San Savino, and in the chapel of de Sarazzi, a piece of Caravaggio. Here lie buried many great scholars and artists, of which I took notice of this inscription. Hospes disce novum, mortis genus, improba felis, dum trahitur digitum mordet, ed interio. Opposite to the facciato of the church is a superb obelisk, full of hieroglyphics, the same that Senesertus, king of Egypt, dedicated to the sun. Brought to Rome by Augustus, erected in the Circus Maximus, and since placed here by Pope Sextus V, it is eighty-eight feet high, of one entire stone, and placed with great art and engines by the famous Domenico Fontana. Hence, turning on the right out of the Porto del Popolo, we came to Justinian's gardens near the Moro Torto, so prominently built as threatening every moment to fall, yet standing so for these thousand years. Under this is the burying place for the common prostitutes, where they are put into the ground sans ceremony. 24 February 1645 We walked to St Roach's and Martins, near the brink of the Tiber, a large hospital for both sexes. Hence to the mausoleum Augusti, between the Tiber and the Via Flaminia, now much ruined, which had formerly contended for its sumptuous architecture. It was intended as a cemetery for the Roman emperors, had twelve ports, and was covered with a cupola of white marble, environed with stately trees and innumerable statues, all of it now converted into a garden. We passed the afternoon at the Sapienza, a very stately building full of good marbles, especially the portico of admirable architecture. These are properly the university schools, where lectures are read on law, medicine and anatomy, and students perform their exercises. Hence we walk to the church of Sant'Andrea della Valle, near the former theatre of Pompey, and the famous Piccolomini, but given to this church and the order, who are Theatins. The Barberini have in this place a chapel of curious encrusted marbles of several sorts and rare paintings. Under it is a place where St. Sebastian is said to have been beaten with rods before he was shot with darts. The cupola is painted by Lanfranc, an inestimable work, and the whole fabric and monastery adjoining are admirable. 
25th February 1645. I was invited by a Dominican friar whom we usually heard preach to a number of Jews to be godfather to converted Turk and Jew. The ceremony was performed in the church of Santa Maria Sopra la Minerva, near the capital. They were clad in white, then exercised at their entering the church with abundance of ceremonies, and when led into the choir, were baptised by a bishop in pontifical alibus. The Turk lived afterward in Rome, sold hot waters, and would bring us presents when he met us, kneeling and kissing the hems of our cloaks. But the Jew was believed to be a counterfeit. This church, situated on a spacious rising, was formerly consecrated to Minerva. It was well built and richly adorned, and the body of St. Catherine de Siena lies buried here. The paintings of the chapel are by Marcello Venuti, the Madonna over the altar is by Giovanni di Fesole, called the angelic painter, who was of the order of these monks. There are many charities dealt publicly here, especially at the procession on the Annunciation, where I saw His Holiness, with all the cardinals, prelates, etc., in Pontificalibus. Dower is being given to three hundred poor girls, all clad in white. The Pope had his tiara on his head, and was carried on men's shoulders in an open armchair, blessing the people as he passed. The statue of Christ at the Columna is esteemed one of the masterpieces of Michelangelo. Innumerable are the paintings by the best artists, and the organ is accounted one of the sweetest in Rome. Cardinal Bembo is interred here. We return by St Mark's, a stately church with an excellent pavement and a fine piece by Perugino of the two martyrs. Adjoining to this is a noble palace built by the famous Bramante. 26 February 1645 Ascending the hill we came to the Forum Trajanum, where his column stands, yet entire, wrought with admirable basso relievo, recording the Dacian War, the figures at the upper part appearing of the same proportion with those below. It is ascended by 192 steps, enlightened with 44 apertures or windows, artificially disposed, in height from the pedestal, 140 feet. It had once the ashes of Trajan and his statue, where now stands St. Peter's of Gilt Brass, erected by Pope Sextus V. The sculpture of this stupendous pillar is thought to be the work of Apollodorus, but what is very observable is the descent to the plinth of the pedestal, showing how this ancient city lies now buried in her ruins, this monument being at first set up on a rising ground. After dinner we took the air in Cardinal Bentivoglio's delicious gardens, now but newly deceased. He had a fair palace built by several good masters on part of the ruins of Constantine's baths, well adorned with columns and paintings, especially those of Guido Reni. 27th February 1645 In the morning Mr Henshaw and myself walked to the trophies of Marius, erected in honour of his victory over the Cimbrians, but these, now taken out of their niches, are placed on the balusters of the capital, so that their ancient station is now a ruin. Keeping on our way, we came to St. Croce of Jerusalem, built by Constantine over the demolition of the Temple of Venus and Cupid, which he threw down. And it was here, they report, he deposited the wood of the true cross, found by his mother Helena, in honour whereof this church was built, and in memory of his victory over Maxentius, when that holy sign appeared to him. The edifice without is Gothic, but very glorious within, especially the roof, and one tribuna, gallery, well painted. Here is a chapel dedicated to St. Helena, the floor whereof is of earth brought from Jerusalem. The walls are of fair mosaic, in which they suffer no women to enter, save once a year. Under the high altar of the church is buried St. Anastasius in Lydian marble and Benedict the Seventh, and they show a number of relics exposed at our request, 
with a file of our blessed Saviour's blood, two thorns of his crown, three chips of the real cross, one of the nails wanting a point, St. Thomas's doubting finger, and a fragment of the title put on the cross, being part of a thin board, some of Judas's pieces of silver, and many more, if one had faith to believe it. To this venerable church joins a monastery, the gardens taking up the space of an ancient amphitheatre. Hence we pass beyond the walls, out at the port of St. Lawrence, to that saint's church, and where his ashes are enshrined. This was also built by the same great Constantine, famous for the coronation of Pietro Alicisodorantis, Emperor of Constantinople, by Honorius II. It is said the corpse of St. Stephen, the proto-martyr, was deposited here by that of St. Sebastian, which it had no sooner touched, but Sebastian gave it place of its own accord. The church has no less than seven privileged altars and excellent pictures. About the walls are painted this martyr's sufferings, and when they built them, the bones of diverse saints were translated to other churches. The front is Gothic. In our return, we saw a small ruin of an aqueduct built by Quintus Marcius, the praetor, and so passed through that incomparable straight street leading to Santa Maria Maggiore to our lodging, sufficiently tired. We were taken up next morning in seeing the impertinences of the carnival, when all the world are as mad at Rome as at other places, but the most remarkable were the three races of the Barbary horses that run in the Strada del Corso without riders, only having spurs so placed on their backs and hanging down by their sides as by their motion to stimulate them. Then of mares, then of asses, of buffaloes, naked men, old and young, and boys, and abundance of idle, ridiculous pastime. One thing is remarkable, they're acting comedies on a stage, placed on a cart or claustrum, where the scene or tiring place is made of boughs in a rural manner, which they drive from street to street with a yoke or two of oxen after the ancient guise. The streets swarm with prostitutes, buffoons, and all manner of rabble. End of section 17